thank you for being here today. We're going to be listening to Dr. Van Lidner and his presentation on Robinson Crusoe and the drama of self-isolation. Van Lidner teaches English. He's in the English department at Montana State University. He received his PhD in literature in 2009 from Northeastern University. And he's a fantastic professor. I had him last year for my mythology class. And I'm excited to see what he has to say on this topic. So thank you all for being here. Remember to mute yourselves for the duration of this presentation and take it away, Ben. A new volcano has erupted, the papers say. And, And last week, I was reading where some ship saw an island being born. At first, a breath of steam 10 miles off, and then uh, a black fleck, basalt probably, rose in the mate's binoculars and caught on the horizon like a fly. They named it. But my poor old island's still unrediscovered unrenameable. None of the books has ever got it right. Huh? About my island? Well, I had 52 miserable small volcanoes I could climb with a few slithery strides, volcanoes dead as ash heaps. I used to sit on the edge of the highest one and count the others all standing up naked and leaden with their heads blown off. And I think if they were the size I thought volcanoes should be, then I had become a giant. And if I had become a giant, I couldn't bear to think what size the goats or the turtles were or the gulls or the rollers. The glittering hexagon of rollers closing and closing in, but never quite. Glittering and glittering. The sky was mostly overcast. The weather, well, my island seemed to be a sort of cloud dump. All the hemispheres left over clouds arrived and hung over the volcano's craters. Their parched throats were hot to touch. (laughs) Was that why it rained so much? And why sometimes the whole place hissed. The turtles would lumber by, high-domed, hissing like tea kettles. And I'd have given years or taken a few for any sort of kettle, of course. The folds of lava running out to sea would hiss, and I'd turn, and then they'd prove to be more turtles. The beaches were all lava, variegated black, red, and white, and gray. The marbled colors made a fine display. And I had uh, water spouts, so half a dozen at a time, far out. They'd come and go, advancing and retreating, their heads in cloud, their feet in scuffed up patches of moving white. Flexible attenuated, sacerdotal beings of glass. I'd watch the water spiral up in them like smoke. Beautiful. Not much company. I get lonely? Yeah. I often gave way to self-pity. Do I deserve this? I suppose I must, I wouldn't be here otherwise. Was there a time when I actually chose this? I don't remember, but there might have been. Well, what's wrong with self-pity anyway? With my legs dangling down familiarly over a crater's ledge, I told myself, pity should begin at home. So the more pity I felt, the more I felt at home. Uh, uh, just daily life. Oh, 
sun set in the sea and the same odd sun rose from the sea and there was one of it and one of me. The island had one kind of everything. It was, it was one kind of tree snail, a bright violet blue thin shell that crept over everything, over the one variety of tree that was a paltry city scrub affair. But snail shells would lay under these in drifts, and from a distance you would swear that they were beds of irises. There was one kind of berry, dark red. I tried it, one by one, hours apart. It's subacid, no fil no ill effects. Not bad. So I made home brew, and I drink this awful fizzy stinging stuff that went straight to my head and play my homemade flute which i think had the weirdest scale on earth and dizzy dance and whoop among the goats homemade homemade aren't we all i felt a deep affection for the smallest of all my island industries or no not exactly because the smallest was a miserable philosophy Hmm? Well, because I didn't know enough. Why didn't I know enough of something? Greek drama or astronomy. Or... All the books I'd read were full of blanks. And the poems? Well, I tried reciting to my iris beds. They flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of... The bliss of what? One of the first things that I did when I got back was look it up. Oh, the sounds and smells. Well, the island smelled of goat and guano. The goats were white, so were the gulls. And they were both too tame, or else they thought I was a goat too, or a gull. I'd be like, meh, 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 tree, tree. I still can't shake them from my ears. They're hurting now. The questioning shrieks and the equivocal replies over a ground of hissing rain and hissing ambulating turtles got on my nerves. But when all the gulls flew up it, once they made a sound like a big tree in a strong wind, its leaves, and I would close my eyes and think of a tree, an oak, say, with real shade somewhere. Shh. I'd heard of cattle getting island sick. I thought the goats were. There was one billy goat who would stand on the side of the volcano that I had christened Mont d'Espoir, or Mount Despair. <laughs> well, I had time enough to play with names. And he'd bleed and bleed and sniff the air, and I'd grab his beard and look at him, and his pupils, horizontal, narrowed up, and expressed nothing, or a little malice. I got so tired of the very colors. One day, I dyed a baby goat bright red with my red berries just to see something a little different. <laughs> and, uh, and then his mother wouldn't recognize him. Hmm. Dreams? Oh, dreams were the worst. Of course, I'd dream of things like food and love. They were pleasant rather than otherwise. But then I would dream of things like slitting a baby's throat, mistaking it for a baby goat. And I had nightmares of other islands, infinities of islands stretching away from mine, islands, just spawning islands, like frogs' eggs turning into polywogs of islands. And I knew that I had to live on each and every one for ages, eventually registering their flora, their fauna, and their geography. And just when I thought I couldn't stand it another minute longer, Friday came. 
accounts of that have everything all wrong. Friday was nice. Friday was nice, and we were friends. If only he had been a woman. I wanted to propagate my kind. So did he, I think. Poor boy. He'd pet the baby goats sometimes, or race around with them, uh, or hold one in his arm. It's pretty to watch. He had a pretty body. And then one day they came and took us off. Now I live here. Another island. It doesn't feel like one, but who decides? My blood was full of them. My brain bred islands. But that old archipelago has petered out. I'm old. I'm bored too. Drinking my real tea. Surrounded by uninteresting lumber. And that knife there on the shelf, it once reeked of meaning, like a like a crucifix, lived. I knew each nick and scratch of it by heart. How many times did I beg and implore it not to break? I knew the bluish blade and the broken tip and the lines of wood grain in the handle. And now it won't look at me at all. Its living soul has dribbled away and my eyes will rest on it and then pass on. The local museum has asked me to leave everything to them. The flute, the knife, my shriveled shoes, my shedding goatskin trousers to see moths have gotten into the fur. Even the parasol that took me such a time remembering the way the ribs should go. It'll still work, but Fold it up, it just looks like a plucked in skinny fowl. How can anyone want such things? On Friday, my dear Friday, he died of measles 17 years ago, come March. Okay, so that's uh, Elizabeth Bishop's poem, Crusoe in England. Elizabeth Bishop was a poet who lived from 1911 to 1979. She's one of the best uh, poets of the 20th century and maybe the best poet that a lot of you have never heard of. Um, She was inspired to write this poem after reading Daniel Defoe's 18th century novel, Robinson Crusoe, the story of which Uh, I assume we're all familiar with on some level, even if it's just a very bare bones level in the sense of Robinson Crusoe, guy stranded on a desert island. That's all I know about it. Um, But towards the end for life, Bishop reread the novel and found herself both uh, enjoying it very much and finding it very touching uh, and sort of captivating and enthralling, but also finding it rather tedious, which it is, uh, and kind of annoyingly didactic. And so she wanted to sort of reimagine this character this character's experiences and this character's voice, uh, you know, in a sort of updated setting instead of the kind of colonial Christian context of Defoe's novel, a post-colonial secular humanist context. Uh, That's the sort of context that at least I hear anyways when I read her poem as opposed to when I read Defoe's novel. For instance, in Defoe's novel, one of the ways in which Crusoe goes about sort of maintaining his sanity amidst this sort of long stretch of involuntary self-isolation that he's forced to endure is basically he just recreates from the ground up the civilization that he's left behind in in England and that he's not sure if he's ever going to be able to return to, including all of its religious traditions, where one of the things that's washed up on the shore from the shipwreck in Defoe's novel is conveniently for Crusoe, 
um, a Bible. And then when Friday does come along in Robinson Crusoe, he's a cannibal whom Crusoe rescues from a, a group of other cannibals who are, are preparing to kill and eat him. Uh, and when he rescues him, rather than asking, you know, this guy what his name is, he just christens him Friday and says, you're Friday from now on because today is Friday. Uh, and you can call me master. And so there's very much this uh, kind of master-servant or even master-slave relationship that obtains between them. And Bishop reimagines the the whole story, you know, sort of without the religious aspect of it, without any sort of dogmatic, didactic aspect to it. She said that all of that had kind of annoyed her while she was reading it. So there's not really any mention of it whatsoever in her poem. And then her Crusoe is, you know, sort of insistent that, accounts of the relationship between Crusoe and Friday, presumably but including Defoe's own, have, have that all wrong, have everything all wrong, and that they were actually friends. And you actually get, I think anyways, the sense of a romantic and sort of intimate relationship between these two men, um, something that evokes Bishop's own relationship with Lota Suarez, with whom she was uh, together for 15 years when the two of them were living in Brazil for 15 years where Bishop herself had sort of been stranded, as it were. She was uh, on a trip to circumnavigate the globe and suffered an allergic reaction in Brazil where she was supposed to just stay for a couple of days before journeying on. And she ended up staying for, for 15 years before then moving back to the United States and spending about the last decade of her life there, like Crusoe, sort of looking back with a kind of bittersweet nostalgia right, on the life that she had lived when she was abroad. So she kind of uses uh, Crusoe's own life or the story of Robinson Crusoe as a kind of template or framework for understanding uh, the events of her own existence and how it unfolded, which strikes me as something that we might do too now uh, in this day and age in 2020 as we endure our own bouts of self-isolation, which while they might not be as intense as Robinson Crusoe's, which lasts for, I think, over 25 years, uh, right around 25 years, nevertheless, they've restricted our freedom of movement, they've circumscribed our existence, they've you know, sort of placed all kinds of limitations on our lives that uh, weren't there before, as a result of which we've had to improvise any number of methods of coping in order to get by. And so I invite you to kind of consider what sort of strange methods of coping you yourself have invented or adopted or innovated over the course of the past six months, you know, in order to uh, get by and, and endure everything that's that's been happening, uh, you know, to us in particular and just around the world. Bishop's Crusoe starts anthropomorphizing everything around him. If you notice uh, in the poem, the water spouts have their heads in the clouds and their feet in moving patches of scuffed up white. The volcanoes uh, are likened to figures with their heads blown off. He's not sure if the gulls and goats think that he's a gull or a goat, or maybe they think they're people now. Uh, he ends up talking to you know, the animals, a good time, just basically sort of doing whatever he can to keep it together. If you, you know, listen to the poem again, or just pick up a copy of it, uh, you know, or look up a copy of it online and, and read it, you'll see that, you know, throughout the poem, there are all kinds of subtle indications that he is very much just sort of on the brink of losing it for a good deal of the time when he's on the island, where the interesting thing that happens then uh, is that in Bishop's imagine, imagining of him back home in England, you know, at least 17 years later, you know, maybe 20 years later, an old Robinson Crusoe just kind of sitting half sloshed in the corner of a pub somewhere on like his, you know, fourth pint of ale is thinking back on this whole episode in his life, these trials and tribulations, this you know, sort of long stretch when he had to do any number of desperate things just to keep his, you know, his thoughts together, uh, you know, and himself from breaking down. She imagines him thinking back on all of this fondly, you know, and I wonder, you know, if you can imagine any sort of scenario you know, in five, 10, 15, better yet, 20 years, when you might look back on some component of your lived life of the past six months with a kind of fondness, 
not fondness for happier times, of course, right? Uh, nothing like that, but some sort of bittersweet, nostalgic recollection for profound experience, a recollection of, I should say, profound experience of profundity itself, of a time when you went through legitimate, authentic trials and tribulations, as opposed to just the repetitive action of jumping through hoops that you've always had the strange feeling didn't necessarily really need to be there. Um, and I guess with all of that in mind, I'd like to just uh, open it up for, you know, the next, well, I don't even know how long we have. What do we go to? Six? We don't need to go to six. Um, you know, but maybe for just 10 or 15 minutes of questions or, or thoughts of your own, because I'm actually legitimately curious to hear what sort of coping strategies right, you yourselves have adopted, you know, or uh, to hear your thoughts on, on Bishop's poem, uh, you know, maybe if there were particular passages of it that you liked or lines that you would like to, to hear again, you know, and then perhaps in, instead of just me going on and on like this, we can jump into a conversation and I want to invite everybody to participate, not just honor students. That means you, mom. Would you be able to reread the towards the beginning of the poem where you were talking about the volcanoes and like how the character was kind of characterizing those volcanoes? Yeah, yeah. One of the the, the second stanza of the poem, you know, begins with him just kind of giving an overview. You know, where the first thing he he decides to, to tell us about his island is that he had fifty two miserable small volcanoes. Uh, so all of a sudden, immediately we sort of get, uh, you know, the impression that this was somebody who probably counted a lot of things over the course of those 25 years just to stay sane, just go around. Count, it's like he's a shepherd and his flock consists of these 52 volcanoes and he's, you know, going up onto the lip of the highest one each day, and counting the rest of them to make sure that they're all still there, where that's a sort of uh, a, a kind of like sanity producing device either that or it's maybe like uh, a symptom of insanity i'm not sure maybe a little bit of, of both uh and it also might remind us of uh, that another really famous character from literature think of characters from literature or film or sort of whatever artistic mediums you you enjoy who've also endured like long involuntary bouts of self-isolation and ask yourselves how they got through it. The bit with the small volcanoes, these little miniature volcanoes, though, makes me think of the little prince, right? The 50 plants on his, you know, planet all by himself, you know, floating through space where he doesn't have a whole lot to tend to, but he does have like this one volcano or something and maybe one or two other things before he decides to leave the planet and go visit other people to find out what they know. Anyway, so Crusoe says, well, I had 52 miserable small volcanoes I could climb with a few slithery strides, volcanoes dead as ash heaps. And I used to sit on the edge of the highest one and count the others standing up naked and leaden with their heads blown off. So just volcanoes dead as ash heaps, naked and leaden with their heads blown off. It's kind of like a volcano cemetery. It's like he's, he's you know, sort of surrounded by all of these other entities that at some point in time just decided they couldn't take it any longer right? and here he is you're sort of one among them trying to get through the trial where where all of them failed so do you think that the volcanoes could be somewhat symbolic of how he feels about himself like not knowing if he's gonna end yeah. up as one of yeah his yeah i mean dead. yeah absolutely i mean 25 years of uh, involuntary self-isolation on a, on a desert island. I'm guessing you're having thoughts of that nature, at least from time to time. He even says later in the poem, right, uh, after he recounts the sorts of nightmares that he's had, that he had on the island. And just when I thought I couldn't stand it another minute longer, Friday came. You know, Friday shows up at the very end of Crusoe's sojourn on the island in, in Defoe's novel. You know, that's the famous single footprint in the sand that he comes across one day after like 20 years on the island and it's this total mystery and it just freaks him the hell out. And then shortly thereafter, you know, the, the cannibals come uh, ashore and he rescues Friday from 
his captors and then sort of makes him his own captive. Right. Right. All, of, all of this becomes um, in sort of even more poignant if you know the history uh, of Bishop's own life and her relationship with Lota Suarez, uh, where they met in and fell in love in 1951 when Bishop had this allergic reaction to a cashew fruit as a result of which she had to stay uh, in Brazil when she was supposed to get back on the ship and leave. She couldn't. As I mentioned, she ended up staying for about 15 years towards the end of which the relationship started to you know, sort of show signs of sort of wearing down, breaking down as, as uh, these things will tend to, to do. Um, you know, and I think it was in, in 1967 that Lotus Suarez, after Bishop had left and gone back to New York just to create, you know, put a little space between them in the hopes that maybe that would do both of them and their relationship some good. Lota followed Bishop to, uh, you know, New York the next evening and overdosed on sleeping pills that night. So with that in mind, you know, those particular sort of images or, or the thoughts in the poem take on an even more profound meaning, which will come back again in another volume, or sorry, another poem in the same volume of poems, probably Bishop's most famous, the Villanelle, you know, one art when she talks about all of the things that she's lost in her life from, you know, mere hours and door keys uh, you know, sort of trivial things like that, that, you know, she's just misplaced. And then she, by a process of rapid acceleration, gets all the way up to cities and rivers and continents that she's lost, lost entirely uh, and cannot recover. And then it culminates with the idea of the loss of a, a single person as being the sort of greatest loss that, that you can endure. It's a, a different person to whom she's referring in that final stanza of that poem, but Loda is still nevertheless there in that poem throughout from beginning to end. I don't have any other questions, so thank you. No problem. Hey, Ben, I actually had a question. Um, so you said like with the mediums that you uh, like the most, and I was wondering, we have a lot of movies that deal with self-isolation, like mm -hmm. Um, like The Lighthouse and Castaway, yeah. Gravity, yeah. and, Pie and, and The Shining, too. And yeah, so, good one. Yeah good, yeah, good good examples. Do you think... Very good examples. Some of those some of those movies deal with isolation a lot differently. Like Life of Pi, it's almost more, like, I don't want to say happier, but it's, like, yeah. more dreamlike. Yeah, do you I think, would say phonier, but no, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, but, <laughs> And the, obviously, then the lighthouse is like super dark about it. But uh, it's think, still at the top of my list. I gotta watch that. It's my sister's really disturbing. <laughs> been telling me too. But how do you think? Um, do you think like the way somebody enters self isolation is determines how how they're gonna go through isolation? Like, does that does that affect it if they're already? Well, yeah, you know? I mean, of, of of course. I mean, we could probably every single one of us could answer this question. You know, in our own way, obviously, that's going to, you know, uh, affect the way in which you go about enduring it to some extent, especially if it's like voluntary or involuntary. You know, with, with Crusoe, he's, he's shipwrecked. It's not something that, that he's seeking where, you know, if you have, um, I don't know, like a story like The, the Shining, he goes to the hotel to, to voluntarily uh, 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 to, to, so they can write, right? It's like a kind of writer's retreat where he'll be able to, you know, sort of be really productive, and then obviously the the opposite ends up happening because the whole place turns out to be haunted, and it slowly, you know, just sort of deteriorates from the inside out. Um, you know, so I think there's any number of just con contextual circumstances surrounding each and every one of us that are going to play a part, you know, in how we endure you know, any kind of experience of isolation. It doesn't even have to be literal isolation or, or literal quarantine. And for a lot of us, it probably, you know, isn't. We were isolated maybe back in the spring at home with our families. So it's like not really isolation, at least not in the sense that the Crusoe experiences it, you know, but, but regardless, um, there are any number of ways to, to feel isolated um, and any number of ways to go about responding to it where I think that we have at least some sort of uh, uh, agency, you know, in determine what our response to it is going to be, regardless of the, the context uh, and the circumstances. 
you know, and that's that's you know one of the points both in Defoe's novel and in um, you know Bishop's poem. What what sort of island industries are we going to get up in order to you know sort of kind of remain sane and and, and productive uh, and positive? You know, from day to day, what sort of tasks are we going to to give ourselves? In Defoe's novel, Crusoe from the very beginning keeps track of the days of the week. Right. You know, as as a way of just providing himself with a foundation so that he never feels like totally disoriented and lost, because otherwise he would have no idea what day of the week it even was. And, you know, that feeling like during summer break and it's kind of exhilarating where you're like, I don't even know what day of the week it is. But if that were like a permanent thing, it'd kind of be a little bit terrifying, you know, so from keeping track of the days of the week so that he knows it's Friday when he rescues Friday. Uh, you know, or in Bishop Crusoe's case, you know, just counting things, counting things, you know, on my 52 volcanoes and this many turtles and, and this many sheep, you know, in developing these kinds of relationships uh, with, you know, inanimate objects or natural phenomena or, you know, flora and fauna, things that in normal society people would look at and go, that guy's kind of off his rocker. He's talking to, you know, his goats and turtles. But that if you're in those circumstances, those might be like the key to preserving sanity, precisely those kinds of things, you know. And I and everybody's sort of shy and doesn't want to talk, and, and that's fine. But I know that you've all probably got your stories of, you know, sort of just kind of interesting, quirky, strange, imaginative, new, innovative things you did you know, last spring or over the course of this summer in order to help navigate and negotiate these strange passages that we're in that weren't things that you would have done otherwise. And that might be things that 10, 15, 20 years from now, you look back on fondly, glad of having had the opportunity to get to do them, right? You know, even though it's, uh, you know, in the midst of uh, a period of, you know, intense suffering, you know, for, for uh, any number of people and some measure of suffering for all of us. So you get that tone of bittersweet nostalgia, nostalgia for something that was not fun uh, when you were actually going through it, but that in recollection acquires a kind of, you know, sort of sheen or, or glow that makes you look back on it um, uh, you know, and almost yearn for it. One of those types of happiness, right? I forget which type it is. There's different types of happiness or kinds of fun where like fun while you do it and fun while you think about it afterwards. And then another type is not fun while you do it, but fun when you think about it, that type. That actually made me think of another question. Do you think that we I touch on organization because that's what we grow up with. So I guess my question would be, if we were raised in a more orderless chaos, mm. do you think we would thrive on that? Um, mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know if I'm going to answer that so well, because I'm just going to tell a little story um, about a, uh, a piece that I was reading in the paper earlier today, the London Review of Books. It's about the difference between a university education now and a university education, say, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago, 30 years ago, um, let's say, which is just before I was in college myself, where university education then was something very different from what it is now, where it was a kind of much more kind of freewheeling, sort of chaotic um, you know, the enterprise, in a sense, where you just kind of were free to move around and you attend your lectures and you know, you do this and you have your, your, your course of study and you're figuring things out on your own, as opposed to the kind of micromanaged nature of higher education today that, you know, I imagine a lot of you would maybe just sort of nod your heads at, you know, just my, my use of that particular term to describe the way higher education unfolds today, where it's all sort of, you know, very monetized and uh, you're, you're always sort of thinking about the ends and, you know, sort of every step is micromanaged and you're constantly, you know, calculating your, your GPA in each of your classes as the semester unfolds and your cumulative GPA, uh, you know, over the course of your academic career. I don't know. I don't have a clue what my GPA was. 
throughout from from the beginning of my college. Well, maybe it's because the first two years I was out of school, it didn't have grades. But anyway, even after that, uh, in my junior and senior years, I had no idea what my GPA was until the until the end when I actually looked at my transcript and I was like, oh, that okay, stuff's all right. You know, so there might be something to be said for that. That uh, as a result of you know the sort of way our society has has developed, you know, in terms of you know, micromanagement and meticulousness of, of organization and the, the idea that we have to like sort of like fill up each half hour of each day with some kind of productive activity, you know, lest we sort of waste an opportunity to gain an advantage or get a leg up on the competition, looking down the road towards our future careers and, and vocations. You know, we might not be so so good when we suddenly it adjusting when we suddenly find ourselves thrust into, um, you know, an environment where we're sort of thrown back on a kind of more open scene, a more open ended scene where all of that sort of hubbub kind of falls away. And it's just a question of how am I going to survive from day to day? And not just survive literally, but but sort of thrive mentally as well. But yeah, I'm curious as to how you yourself found it when you were suddenly, you know, thrown into it, when it was suddenly thrust upon you, like when your freedom of movement was uh, radically curtailed, what did you do? Did you, was there a sense of panic? What am I supposed to do? It was there a sense of freedom. There was there a sense of panic and freedom simultaneously. Like, oh, I can do anything. Oh, I can do anything. Oh, there's a chat question. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, Andy asked, considering the invention and innovation of technology, it split <laughs> generations between people who had it their whole life and those that did not. Do you think yeah. that there will be a split between people that remember the pandemic and those that do not? And do you think there will be any major implications for future generations? <sighs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, there will definitely be a kind of split just as, um, you know, there's a split between, you know, me and uh, a lot of you insofar as, you have no memory, say, of, uh, of 9-11, like, like literally no memory of it, because uh, some of you were, maybe even several of you, many of you were born after it happened. Uh, and that is something that, you know, uh, boggles my mind every once in a while when I think about it, mainly because it's indicative of, of uh, you know, how, how quickly I'm getting old, I'm getting old. You know, in the same way that I don't have any recollection, you know, of, of whatever, uh, you know, the assassinations of, you know, JFK and um, Martin Luther King and, uh, you know, Bobby Kennedy, the way my my mom does. Like, she can tell you exactly where she, she was when those things happened and, you know, the, the kind of uh, effect that they had, you know, on her kind of outlook of, uh, on the world. And I can do the same thing with you know, sort of September 11th, I was in Amsterdam. So it was early in the afternoon and I was at a, uh, a Jewish sandwich shop ordering a sandwich uh, with the person that I was uh, living with then, you know, and the guy behind the counter you know, noticed uh, really easily that I was an American, uh, probably because I was wearing like a baseball cap and not saying anything. And, you know, and he pulled me aside and he like pulled me into his office, you know, sort of in the back corner of the sandwich shop. And I had no idea what was what was going on and what was going to happen. Uh, and he just sat me down in front of his television. And I thought he was like showing me an action movie or something. Uh, but it obviously all dawned on me pretty quickly and sort of what was happening. I was really 
you know, a memorable experience. And there's I can go on with with sort of stories about what it was like in Amsterdam over the course of the next you know several days uh, in terms of the the response of the people there you know to to what had had just happened. Uh, and I think yeah that in the in the same way. 20 years from now or 30 years from now, you know, you'll be looking at, you know, people then who are the same age that you are now and, and they won't have any recollection of this. And you'll, you'll sort of find that strange who obviously knows what the hell is going to happen in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, you know, that, 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 you know, all of us and, you know, those, those, those to come are going to have to in, endure and, and go through, but, you know, probably still, yeah, that's going to have uh, an impact. It'll kind of create a natural gulf between, you know, sort of generations um, as opposed to just kind of the arbitrary ones that we assign, just sort of saying like every 20 years, 1980, 2000, 2020. Um, but in terms of what that that uh, impact will, will be and what, he, uh, you know, precise effect it, it, it will have, you know, I, I don't really know. I've, I've thought about it vaguely. You know, from from time to time, what sort of cautiousness, for instance, you know, this uh, event is going to, you know, in, instill in us, but in, you know, you particular, maybe even people younger than you, my friends, kids, you know, for instance, um, you know, a kind of cautiousness or, you know, vigilance or wariness, just kind of regarding uh, contact with other people that's not just going to dissolve uh, and evaporate in, into nothing instantaneously once we're in the clear with respect to the pandemic, I'm guessing. Hey, Ben. Yeah. Hi. Um, I Have you read um, Dunn's No Man is an Island? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you think bishop converses with the the main idea in that book of like man is a social being yeah. and um when when he's in an isolated state you know he he tends to have a, a bad time of it but given yeah. bishop's um personal you know life history where for the most part she was kind of her own island and the people that she came um, into relationships with or into contact with were kind of people that were just kind of like visiting her island. Um, yeah. So how, um, so I guess how how is she kind of conversing with that idea? Yeah, well, she she definitely <laughs> is because her her favorite poets, uh, a lot of her favorite poets. Are the uh, the metaphysical poets of the seventeenth century? George Herbert, uh, you know, is her her favorite. But uh, you know, John Donne was somebody whose whose work she enjoyed, um, you know, very much. And for those of you who don't know, John Donne is great seventeenth century English poet. Kind of comes right on the heels of Shakespeare, uh, and a lot of sort of quotations or phrases or sayings that that you're aware of and that you maybe think have just been in existence forever. You know, come from a poet like done, you know, for instance, this idea that, uh, you know, no man is in an island. That's a quote from one of his, his poems. And then it's just a little while after that, that Defoe kind of writes, Rob, that Defoe writes Robinson Crusoe and kind of sort of like takes up this theme. And like, well, okay, maybe no man's an island, but what happens if we put man on an island for a really long time and sort of by, him, by himself? Uh, but yeah, the idea is, is essentially that, that we're social creatures that, you know, not only thrive on, but also require uh, and need contact. And that when we're, you know, deprived of it, uh, yeah, we're likely to have a difficult go of it. And we're likely to fall back on our natural, you know, imaginativeness and innovativeness in order to concoct it, you know, or, or, or create it. Uh, you know, as, as Crusoe does in these relationships that he has with the beaches and the water spouts and the volcanoes and the goats and the turtles and the, uh, the gulls, you know, and just the, the waves of the, the water uh, itself, which he imagines as closing in around him, uh, you know, in a glittering hexagon of rollers, just kind of constantly closing in around him, but never quite, he says, they never quite swallow him up. So they're sort of anthropomorphized in that sense, too. Um, 
Uh, and Bishop in, in her own life, you know, it was a very lonely existence. Her father died before she was one year old and her mother was permanently institutionalized before she was five. So that she basically never really knew uh, either of them at all, just had some very dim, disturbing memories uh, from her first five years of, of her mother as her mental state was uh, deteriorating. And so throughout her life, she lived a very kind of nomadic uh, existence and sort of traveling from, from place to place and never really staying in any place for all that long and just drifting out, in and out of other people's lives or, or having them drift in and out of, of hers so that it's not until she's 40 years old in 1951 that she actually finally finds a home for the very, very first time uh, by accident, you know, when she's stranded uh, in Brazil uh, and ends up staying for 15 years where in the last decade of her life after she'd come back to, to Massachusetts, she said of that time period, I guess I shouldn't complain about too much. I had 10 or 12 really good years there of the utmost happiness, which seems to be about as much as any human being could ask for. But I, you know, she's, she's proof uh, of, of the saying, you know, now because those were the happiest years of her life when she had, you know, uh, a home, you know, and, a family, if not in the you know, sort of narrow kind of nuclear traditional uh, sense, you know, in a broader sense, uh, in a no less valid sense, you know, she had a family, people she lived with, people who you know sort of surrounded her and were were, were part of a um, you know a network that provided her with you know, support. And it's not coincidental that this was the time in her life when, as a writer, she was most productive, contrary to the whole sort of myth and legend of the the artist recluse you know who needs uh, solitary confinement in order to produce you see what happens when you actually take up that line of thinking in the shining and we have another question from the chat from seth damn it, all these oh good, oh, good job <laughs> <laughs> he said to rip off Andy's question, are people at their best or worst when isolated? And if what, what pulls each individual through this moment, letting us be our best rather than our worst? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think I think we have the I think it's it's likely that we can end up in our at our worst if we allow you know, sort of any number of impressions to close in over us. You know, if we allow those, those, those rollers to encroach to the, to the point where we're, you know, sort of drowned in them, you know, whatever kind of dark waters or dark thoughts that, that they might be. So we're, we're really in a situation where that's something that we're susceptible to when we're isolated. But I also do think that we have the capacity to be at our best then as well, because we're thrown back on our own inventiveness, we're thrown back on our own imagination so that instead of just kind of sitting in the comparative lap of, of luxury, you know, sedated and, and content with, you know, sort of everything uh, at our fingertips where, um, you know, this is a, a set of circumstances that seems unlikely to me, you know, to really sort of birth uh, you know, sort of great imaginativeness. Well, it's the old cliche that necessity is the mother uh, of all in all invention. Kate, can you t read the second part of the, the, the question to me one more time? Yeah. Um, he asked if it's the worst that is brought out, what pulls each individual through this moment and lets us be our best rather than the worst? Uh, you know, stamina, endurance, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, cliches that I can kind of go to here. Um, that are at least cliches to me or not cliches, maybe, but just sort of famous quotations, you know, uh, everything from Robert Frost saying the best way out is through, you know, or Churchill saying when you're going through hell, keep going, uh, you know, right in the sort of middle of, of World War II. So a certain sense of doggedness, a certain um, you know, sort of adamant sort of self-insistence, mm, that's maybe not the best phrase, you know, just a, a willingness to be able a willingness to draw on our own and sort of inmost resources, uh, enable to, and sorry, it's definitely time to go because I'm having trouble putting complete sentences together. Not coincidentally, my cup is empty. Um, 
you know, but a, a willingness to draw on, you know, our capacity for, right, um, you know, sort of dogged resolution and just to, you know, to, to sort of be able to say like, you know, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to get through this and I'm actually going to rely on and exercise my imagination because it doesn't just happen willy nilly of its own accord. You can't just sit there and wait for the muses to sort of strike and for your imagination to just sort of kick into gear and, and show you the way. There are exercises that you have to do in the same way that if you want to stay in shape physically, you know, you've got to run or walk or hike or climb or go to the gym and, and, and do your crunches uh, in the same way in order to get through like, you know, periods of, you know, of, of difficulty where you're thrown back on your, your own mind and, you know, uh, you know, it's capacity, uh, you know, to sort of help you kind of frame what's happening and think your way through it. You know, exercises that you need to do. And this is where the arts come in. This is where reading novels and poems or writing poems or painting paintings or sculpting sculptures, you know, comes into play. And uh, if those are skills, you know, that they don't practice, you know, your imagination, your memory too, or they're going to atrophy in the same way that your, you know, muscles will if you're not, uh, you know, at the, at the gym lifting, you know, every Thursday evening. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm definitely done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ben. Um, I have posted the link in the chat. So honors to our one students, make sure you click on that. Um, thank you so much for giving this presentation, Ben. I really enjoyed it. Um, no so problem. I, it's I great to see some around. people's okay. faces down there at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you so much. Take care, everybody. Bye, Georgia.